Thank you very much for that really wonderful introduction. And um, I'm just going to switch my own phone off because I fear that there might be a kind of a local phone call coming in um, from my partner. So I'm just switching that off. And I also just want to put my clock on because I'm notorious for running over time. So forgive me, I should have done that beforehand and I haven't. But if I get my thing going, then I'll speak to, speak to time, but wave if I'm going on too long. So yes, the antisocial life of, of memory. Well, that's just because I like to be difficult. And um, I, I just decided that I wouldn't quite do what I, was, I said I would do originally, and that happens quite frequently. But in my view, that's where interesting ideas can come from. And um, if you get that kind of slightly um, yawny feeling in your stomach when it comes to a topic, which I was slightly beginning to with the social life of memory, because I've, I've written about that a lot, I thought, no, no, I've got to kind of think about this a bit differently. So I began to do that. And so these are very early thoughts, so forgive me for that. Um, and it's deliberately an antisocial structure, OK? It, it deliberately does not fit together. Um, as Siebold says, it's quite useful, actually, to have things that don't quite align, that kind of sit in a jagged manner with each other. And that's kind of what I've done with this particular... Uh, lecture. So let's see if it sort of works, shall we? So earlier in the year, I um, was fortunate enough to be able to go to Singapore as part of a research project that um, I'm involved in with the Australian Research Council. And part of that is examining the impact of data centres and visiting data centres such as this one. So travelling with these kind of future talks that I have to do in mind, I was struck here, as I was taking photographs from the outside, not by the social life of memory, but actually the sense of antisocial life, the lack of human contact, the racks of digital data that seem cut off and isolated from the rest of the cityscape and its social life of memories. Yet data centres such as this one, globally, are what enable the circulation of data that stores and circulates and enables our digital memories to travel. We could not do without them. More than 2.3 billion people, that's almost one third of the world's population, are now estimated to be reading, to be creating and sharing personal memories of social media sites online, just as you all were yesterday and presumably at this moment too. But the sharing of these memories, their social life, is enabled through social media platforms that are hidden in vast hidden infrastructures like this one and this data centre in Singapore. And this to me seems to be the very opposite of the vibrant social life of memory. Sure, they hum with electricity when you go in them, and yet they feel to be dead spaces in my experience. There's something slightly aloof and apart. This data centre site was actually on the periphery of Singapore. They resist connection with other cultural memories in that sense. So what I propose here then is if metaphorically memory has a vibrant social life, then memory, in my view, also has a troubled antisocial life. This is the life of memory that, yes, it causes annoyance and disapproval. The life of memory that's disorderly and rebellious. The life of memory that opposes mnemonic laws and protocols. And the life of memory that robs and thieves from the imaginary in ways that it shouldn't. And the life of memory that sulkily sits in the corner, rejecting mnemonic company, refusing to mix with the life of other memories but also the life of memory beyond the human, separate as water and resolute as rock. So if we accept in some form then that there is something that we can call metaphorically the antisocial life of memory that has this kind of dissociative life, how can we understand this? What modes of analysis can the 21st century mnemologist one who studies and researches memory, develop to understand this antisocial life of memory's moments of refusal, of lawlessness, of theft. How does the inclusion of the antisocial life of memory call for new kinds of methods and modes of analysis? 
ones that disrupt the discrete methods of the social sciences. What about the anti-social sciences? Approaches that unsettle the human centricity of the humanities and indeed memory studies to activate new and divergent vantage points on memory's complex life. So I'm just going to begin today to talk a bit about that. And as I said, it's an antisocial structure. It deliberately doesn't fit together. It leaves lots of gaps that I hope you can kind of think about and question and interrogate and pull together yourself. This is no, by no means a cohesive thesis. It's not meant to be. So I'll start with thinking then about the antisocial life of memory and how that builds out of theoretical thinking from the social life of memory. Then I want to do a quick story, a quick journey, and I might get us to stand up for that because we'll all, I'm sure, be feeling a bit sleepy at that point and we need to kind of dance around. Um, and I'll take us from this idea of rare earth to digital witness. You know, the frictions of, of memory that we can uncover if we use new materialism in relation to digital memory. Then I want to just suggest two other antisocial methods and antisocial modes of analysis. Um, one is a tool for analysis that I'm calling memory capital and mnemonic labor. I'll show you that in a bit. And the other is this idea of disruptive vantage points and using creative practice. And I'm really pleased to see that there's you know, more creative practice happening at mnemonics now in terms of what people are doing and what people are presenting, because I think that that's a really positive way forward. So let's just orientate ourselves then in terms of thinking about, theoretically, the antisocial life of memory. Um, and these are just some pointers, as I said, and I'm sure you'll have much better ideas, much more interesting ideas. This is just a provocation, really, for getting us to think about the antisocial life of memory. Well, to think about the antisocial life, of course, we need to think about the theoretical antecedents of the social life of memory, of which there are now many. Um, I think in the, in the call for papers for this uh, conference, Arjun Aparajurai's uh, book, The Social Life of Things, Commodities in Cultural Perspective, is mentioned. And we know that commodities, like persons, as a result of that work, have social lives. They circulate and accumulate value. Mikhail Bakhtin's idea of the social life of discourse has also been really important in terms of alerting us to the ways in which language, words, discourse, circulate and change and adapt meaning to dialogic processes. In discourse in the novel, for example, the dialogic and in the dialogic imagination, Bakhtin describes how, and as I quote, as a living socio-ideological concrete thing, as a heteroglot opinion, language for the individual consciousness lies on the borderline between oneself and the other. The word in language is half someone else's. But it's in the preceding paragraph of that phrase that we see the term socially charged life. And Bakhtin says, all words have the taste of a profession, a genre, a tendency, a party, a particular work, a particular person, a generation, an age group, the day and the hour. Each word tastes of the context and context in which it has lived its socially charged life. I would suggest to you it also smacks of its anti-socially charged life. Every word does, every symbol does. And if we think about that, then that too has implications for thinking about the anti-social life of memory. And what of other precedents then? Well, there's Alondra Nelson's uh, work that uses social life somewhat differently in her work, The Social Life of DNA. In examining how genetics has impacted on American 21st century politics, she argues that genetics has become the marker through which the unsettled past is reconciled. She cites examples of DNA, for example, being used for the purposes of reconciliation from the living children of Argentina's disappeared with their biological family members. There's also then the well-known text by James Fentress and Chris Wickham, Social Memory, 
which examines the ordering and transmission of memory. And they make the observation that a memory can be social only if it is capable of being transmitted. And to be transmitted, a memory must first be articulated. Social memory, then, they say, is articulate memory. So is it that antisocial memory is that which is inarticulate? Yet Fentress and Wickham concentrate, although they do concentrate on articulation in terms of words and narrative, they also explain that articulate memory does not have to be expressed in words. It can be articulated in sound, in image, in gesture, in ritual. So where does antisocial memory fit with this then? I don't have the answer, I'm just kind of asking the questions, okay? But their work certainly reminds us, as does that of Joanne Garda Hansen and Karen Borchman in social memory technology, that there are particular ways in which the life story of a person can be transformed into something that has a social life, in which memories can travel. But in order for those memories to travel, what is it that's then got stuck? What frictions have taken place? What is it, what antisocial elements are there to the social life of memory. So what does this suggest then in terms of the anti-social life of memory? The origins in English of the word social refer, derives from Latin, which means of companionships, of allies, united, living with others, and originally a follower, memories that move, that follow others. But what would it be then if a memory is not social? Is it asocial? Is it antisocial? Is it that forgetting is asocial? Can we talk about the asocial life of forgetting or the antisocial life of forgetting? Perhaps the antisocial life of memory is that which impacts not so much with its vibrant social life, as this conference suggests, but rather is that to do which is that which is destructive, negative, death-driven. And in that case then, do we think of memories of war, of violence, of genocide? Indeed, in my view, the whole patriarchal cultures in which we find ourselves now, and which consistently forget peace, forget women, forget the planet, as in fact being this having this anti-social life? Are we in fact living in an anti-social memory culture? But we don't know it. What implications then does this have for methods and modes of analysis? And how can we taste, smell, see, hear, analyse this anti-social life of memory? Well, I found some cues some clues for kind of thinking about this within queer studies, in which there's been for some time now an interest in what we might call negative thinking. But there's kind of several strands within queer studies in terms of thinking about negative thinking, and I found that there was one strand that I very much didn't like and one that I, I kind of accorded with this sensibility of trying to think through antisocial memory. And Judith Halberstam, in The Antisocial Turn in Queer Studies, says forgetfulness is constituted as a kind of entropic force that must be halted by rigorous memory practices. But in each case, the underprivileged category actually sustains purposive and intricate modes of oppositional knowledge, many of which can be associated with and linked to forms of activity that we've come to call queer. Halberstam critiques the apolitical, antisocial thesis of Edelman, which places queerness epistemologically at the limit, embracing negativity. And one of the things she observes is that actually what we see in this sort of negative drive of this antisocial turn is in its rejection of futurity is also the rejection of the politics of hope which she says is ethically problematic, and I would agree with that. She says the apolitical, antisocial agenda cuts both ways, 
And while it mitigates against liberal fantasies of progressive enlightenment and community cohesion, it also coincides uncomfortably with a fascist sensibility. So drawing on this, I would suggest that alongside explorations of the social life of memory, and I've done, you know, a lot of my own work has looked at that, the social inheritance of the Holocaust, for example, was looking at that social life of memory. I would suggest it's important conceptually to acknowledge and explore this sense of the antisocial life of memory. But following on from uh, Halberstam's work, I would suggest that we, we don't see this as a kind of alternativist concept. It's not sort of set up um, antithetically to the social life of memory. Rather, it's, you know, if you think about quantum states, it can be there at the same time. You know, it, it's, it's like the, the photon and the wave in, in relation to light. We can have both, okay? And it's not even that you flip-flop between them, but that it's a conceptual tool for sort of looking at something from a slightly different vantage point. So what would it be then for memory to be antisocial? The antisocial life of memory, I would say, is one that we might observe causes annoyance and disapproval. It's a life of memory that, by some, may be deemed to be unacceptable. By some, at some point in time, is deemed to be offensive or disruptive disorderly, lawless, rebellious. And of course, these things can change, but it helps us, for example, you know, it might help us understand why it is that um, within certain indigenous cultures, it may be that photo having photographs of the deceased is de deemed to be antisocial to their memory. It's not something that you would do, okay? Or within Romani culture, the idea of holding on to property and keeping it in a museum of the Holocaust is actually deeply antisocial in terms of memory. You know, that doesn't fit with rituals of Romani culture. And so it just allows you to kind of think a bit differently about uh, mnemonic laws and customs. Antisocial memory then might be contrary or opposed to particular mnemonic laws but we also need to recognise that mnemonic laws and practices can change over time and over place. Antisocial memory is also that which refuses mnemonic company, so it might refuse connections, and sometimes very deliberately. I've got a project at the moment that I'm working on in relation to migrant memories, and there's an archive that we were working with of activists in relation to migrant memories who did not want the university to be a host for these memories. They were hostile to that for good reasons, actually. They'd had very bad experiences before and they wanted to hold on to their archive themselves. And in a sense, that's, a, that's a, a, an example of antisocial memory as a political act to say, I will not stick to you, I will not connect to your institution, you know, as a way of, of having, in holding on to power in relation to those particular memories. So these are just some ideas then about how we might think about antisocial memory. And I don't have time in this particular lecture to take you through all of those in detail, but maybe then it might just get, enable us to think a little bit differently about the social life of memory. And what I want to do now in the second part of the lecture is, first of all, think about how new materialism in relation to memory studies, and that there are a number of papers here that are doing this very well, can reveal, it seems to me, certain antisocial dimensions of memory in new and interesting ways. So I'll take you through, and some of you forgive me for this, you'll be familiar with certain aspects of this work on rare earths that I've been doing. Um, and then I want to look at two particular conceptual tools and methods. And the final bit will be a very short reading from a new play of mine, um, just as a kind of provocation for thinking about creativity. Is everyone okay? Do we need to kind of stand up and wriggle? <laughs> no. 
Okay, if you do, do I mean, if, you need to, if you're like me and you get kind of really restless and need to stand up and move around, do, okay? Don't apologize for it. It's, it's, it's necessary. We're kind of imprisoned, aren't we, in these chairs and feel that we can't even breathe because it's rude. Okay, just, just breathe, shout, jump up and down, move around. Okay, it's good. So let's think then about this. I'm going to tell you a, a short story. When you look at this slide, what is it that you see? Some of you might see an image of rock art. Some of you might see what seem to be human-type figures. Some of you, like me, might look at it and think, oh, colour red. Okay? And the colour red is extremely important in terms of thinking about antisocial memory. Because the color, this particular colour red, this very vibrant red here, and in fact it's not coming out in such a vibrant way on this screen, is as a result of a particular rare earth. So I'm talking here about going beneath the screen, okay? Not beneath the screen just into this bit of technology, but beneath the screen into a much longer journey of understanding how that bit got there as the colour red to show you an image of rock art from Western Australia, supposedly seamlessly, that's allowed you to socially connect to it. Well, what's the antisocial dimensions that have produced it? Now, those of you who did chemistry will know that rare earths are this small group of minerals um, that are, in fact, not very rare at all. They're all over the planet, but the places where they're most found are in China, in Brazil, and in a small area in Western Australia. What's rare about them is the difficulty with which we can rarefy them and extract them from everything else. And in that process, it causes all sorts of problems and pollution, and it's very antisocial, okay? So one of the antisocial dimensions of that colour red that you've just seen, that beautiful image of rock art that's been transported from a wall in Western Australia, is this. Okay? In some senses, it's very beautiful, actually, this open cast mine, when you look at the image from that view. But look at what it's doing to the planet. Look at what it's doing to the Earth and Mount Wells. So Linus, a particular company that I've been researching, um, extracts from Western Australia uh, through this rare earth mine, but it didn't actually process this material in Australia because it's not allowed to, because it's too dirty. It has to then take it elsewhere. So it transports it many thousands of miles across Australia to Fremantle to an initial processing plant and Again, this doesn't look particularly social, does it, in terms of the social life of memory? Transports it further, and this is your, you know, your rare earth production process, if you like, concertina down into a few slides. And um, it looks a bit like heroin, doesn't it? Well, maybe it is. It's the digital heroin of our age, and that we are kind of addicted to these screens and using them in every context. And we don't know what it is in terms of the antisocial dimensions of digital memory. That doesn't look too bad, does it? But once you get to this, you begin to realise that there are global frictions happening at a local level as a result of the production and processing of this rare earth in Malaysia, in Kuantan province, which is uh, a restricted economic zone, which means that you can kind of do what you want, actually, as a company, in terms of uh, producing and processing certain things, and also with great tax breaks. Okay? So these are local people that um, I interviewed some while back and we're in contact with, um, Tanya Notley and I, who, who co-did this project. And they have founded an activist group called Stop Linus in order to dry, try and prevent the largest rare earth processing plant on the planet opening up in their hometown. And they wanted to stop it because 
they felt that there was no real plan for what would happen in terms of the pollution from this plant. And the pollution includes small amounts of radioactive waste. Radioactive waste, which they felt was not going to be contained properly, that would be released into the river system, that would ruin their possibilities of their fit for fishing communities and cause genetic mutations in their children and other major health difficulties. And they've been through this before, okay, with other companies. So they know that it's important to protest about this. They haven't prevented the plant from opening. But interestingly, through digital media, and that's the kind of implicated agency of digital media, it seems to me, I'm able to show you this, its antisocial dimensions, through the social dimensions of memory. So one of the things that Joe said is, if the waste is not handled properly, it may leak into the environment. This can happen via air waste, water waste, solid, solid waste. It may kill marine life, endanger the population of Kwantan, and endanger any flora and fauna within Kwantan. So one of the things they then did, and they, they, they continued to be antisocial in their methods with this company, Linus decided that they wouldn't allow any photography around the site. They wouldn't allow any photography of a report that they had allowed um, local people to see. They said they would allow people to go in with one pencil and paper. So the protesters created a chain of people. Over three days, people would go in for an hour, copy, come out, another person would go in and copy by hand and then they typed it up and put it on the internet, okay? So it's a really interesting, uh, I think, example of some of the frictions, antagonisms, that lie behind a seemingly smooth screen image. You know, the easily called up image of rock art, and it's also important to say that many rock art sites in Western Australia are also being destroyed by mining of all kinds, despite Australian legislation. So there's all that behind that image, if you like. The seamless sociality of that image involves many antisocial dimensions. So just to summarise that story, so what we see in that image is it's implicated in this destruction of this 50,000-year-old indigenous people's memories. Australia exports its ore for processing out of sight. You have this large rare earth site, you have this special economic zone, and then you have fear of act activists concerns the leaching of radioactivity. And the activists are still there but under threat as this lamp continues. And you and I meanwhile and me continue to use PowerPoint showing you that image, but all this is kind of implicated. And it's there at the same time. It's not that there's the social life of memory and the anti-social life of memory. They're there in quantum states, but we kind of refuse to see the other, okay? Or I do a lot in my life because it would make it very difficult if I constantly see these other dimensions. You know, do I then say, well, I'm not going to use any of these devices at all. Am I not going to fly here by plane and give this talk? You know, it, so there's all sorts of things there that um, it does reveal that are then important. So what other tools then might we think about in relation to uh, antisocial methods and antisocial modes of analysis? We take it for granted, don't we, that in the social sciences, we're going to use methods that are, in a sense, are social, hence it's social sciences. But what about methods or conceptual tools that might then reveal these frictions in particular ways? Well, I think it's important then to... One of the things I've done in that little story of rare earths is try to reveal the materiality, the political economy, of memory and I think that the political economy of memory is crucial to thinking about antisocial memory and 
one way in which I propose we could think about this is to draw on the work of Pierre Bourdieu uh, and the idea of cultural capital, um, in which Bourdieu recognises that non-financial assets can result from accumulated labour involved in cultural production and consumption. Bourdieu suggests also that there's a cultural field that involves the accumulation of mnemonic of, of capital. And I would suggest that there's then a cultural field that we might call the memory field. And memory capital arises from the accumulation of mnemonic labour. Now, Bourdieu distinguishes between different kinds of cultural capital. He talks about objectified cultural capital, institutionalised cultural capital, and some social sciences, scientists have also then talked about social capital, building on uh, Bourdieu's work. And what I would suggest then is that we can think about this process of antisocial memory through this relationship between mnemonic labour and memory capital that's accumulated in different states. Now, of course, there are probably many other states to this, but I, I was thinking that there are probably four, and that the first is embodied memory capital. So that which is, you know, accumulated human dispositions, such as repertoires, specialist knowledge, and stories about the past. And many of your work thinks about this sense of embodied memory capital, but then how it is changed into institutionalised memory capital. But in order, I would suggest, for it to be changed into institutionalised memory capital, it has to go through this bit. It has to go through some form of mnemonic labour. Additional mnemonic labour will be needed to accumulate institutionalised memory capital. <clears throat> now, institutionalised memory capital is that which is conferred and recognised as memory by institutions, and that might include the institution of the family, the school, states, public memory institutions, museums, etc. Within that, then, there might also be what we call objectified memory capital. And again, it will need to go, it will need to, it will need mnemonic labour and largely that will be human labour, but increasingly it will be algorithmic labour as well. But human labour has programmed the algorithm after all in order to make that possible. And these are semi-fixed memory artefacts, such as web pages, such as photo albums, digital books, archives, as well as mobile phones, USB sticks, computers, data centres. All the examples there I've given are digital, but that's because more of my work at the moment thinks about digital memory, but you can think about any mnemonic artefact in terms of objectified memory capital. Then there's a fourth state here, which Bourdieu certainly does not recognise at all. Okay? Anything beyond the human is, is not of interest to most social scientists in, 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 at the time that he was writing that particular work. So what I've included here, and this kind of very much fits with this turn, I think, within memory studies of thinking about the Anthropocene and um, Steph Krapp's work in particular has, has been thinking about this, um, and Lucy and Jessica's work on the natural history of memory. We need to also then think about ecological memory capital. These are unnatural elements, unnatural being together, such as forests, water, rare earths and digital waste. So I kind of put those things together. It's all the things that kind of are of and on the planet, but that also are memory capital, and which very often get kind of left out of the picture. If you think, for example, in New Zealand now, there's a particular river that has been given the right to memory, the right to be remembered, because that river actually is, it's not just water, 
it's not just the environment, it carries with it the stories of the people of that locality. It carries the spirit, the spirits of the people. And so it has a right to memory. And so this is just to sort of suggest that too, that you know, we, we think about these wider uh, ecological issues when we're thinking about um, how we might understand antisocial memory. So this, I'm just kind of putting out there as a, as a tool for antisocial materialist analysis, if you like. And if you start tracing these bits here, that's where you begin to see the friction, okay? Whenever you see people, activists, for example, trying to get something institutionalised as memory, that's a struggle. And um, it, it's really interesting, I think, on, on the way into this, we were having a chat and thinking about the way in which memory studies in Latin America, it seems to me, is much more thinking about activist memories, memories as struggle, what we might call these antisocial dimensions of memory, in ways that perhaps European memory studies is not. And that might be a gross generalisation, and you can all shout at me, but that was, that was just a thought as we were walking in this morning. So that's an analytical tool. The second analytical tool, and which I want to then show in practice and through the practice of my own work as a playwright, and you'll see here, this is, it's disjunctive, isn't it? You'll think, my God, she's jumping to something else now. It's quite deliberate. Okay, so you've got a gap, and you can shake your arms now and have a wriggle, okay? Breathe. <sighs> okay. Left that bit, moving on to the next bit. But they will sit alongside each other, and I hope sort of um, antagonise you into thinking about other forms of connection, not the ones that I've made here, which are not necessarily the best. So this second antisocial method, I would suggest, is to use a disruptive vantage point. And that doesn't necessarily mean clambering on a chair or running around a room, but children will do that, won't they, to gain a different vantage point. But we get very trained in our methods. We get very trained in our approaches. And it's really important to just take ourselves out of that quite regularly, if we can. And... Um, one of the things that I've been exploring, and I would imagine lots of you here perhaps already know it, I'm probably late to coming into this, but is kind of going back to that earlier work of H.G. Wells, who was a sociologist, who said that actually it's, it's the work of the sociologist to think about utopias, to think about the future. And if you're thinking about the future, then you're also thinking about the past. Okay, and I would suggest that as a method, it's really interesting for memory studies, those of us working in memory studies, to think about the future and then look back. Okay, sometimes when you get really stuck, when you think, what is it I'm supposed to be analysing here? What is it that's important? Try putting yourself 50 years hence or 150 years hence and think, how will the world look from that point of view? What is it that will be left in archives, in museums, in data centres? What is it that will be important? And, and it's not then that that's what you should study, but it just allows you a different vantage point. And it's Ruth Levitas who has suggested that this is a, a possibly useful way of thinking about this. Um, that's too soon. Um, Ruth Levitas in Utopia as Method reminds us that the imagination has long been part of sociological method, and not just from H.G. Wells, but a number of other thinkers as well. C. Wright Mills is another one who argued for the concept of the sociological imagination. And we already have the Mnemonic Imagination, authored by Michael Pickering and Emily Keatley. And in their work, they talk about memory as creative practice. And I think thinking about that aspect of memory can be really important to just take a different vantage point methodologically for 
thinking not just about the social life of memory, but the anti-social life of memory. So I want to show you now, just a sort of, as I come towards the latter part of my talk, um, I want to talk about a play that I've written in the past year. Um, I've written a number of plays, and they always kind of link to uh, normally activism that I'm involved in, and they also link to the kind of academic work that I'm doing. It, it's a kind of method in its own right, really. Um, and this particular play uh, is called The Unkind, and it comes kind of in the wake of the UK's madness in voting for Brexit, and the despair, really, that personally I felt at that moment, as it, as it sort of it felt there was this sort of fascist turn, really, in the UK, this kind of disaggregation from the rest of Europe. And so I wanted then to think about what the world would be like in 50, 60 years' time, and how would it be to look back? Um, and the term the unkind comes from... There was a sort of... There has been, over the past year, this rising discourse around the topic of kindness, the practice of kindness, that somehow it's wrong to be kind. And yet we are humankind, that is our name. So we are naturally kind, it seems to me. And so I was then thinking about what would it be like if we were in a world in which kindness was banned, in which children were raised to think of kindness as wrong. How would that be, and what kind of world would we live in? The play is part of a trilogy, which is called Preoccupations, and it, um, it includes one piece called Cacti Hearts, which is set in Israel-Palestine, and another piece called Blind Lies, which is set in India-Pakistan, during uh, going back to partition. The Unkind is a, the longer piece of the three, and they're, they're meant to be performed together. Um, when I wrote the first draft, it had a father in it that had to retreat into hiding from the British authorities within his own attic, the attic of his home, after he'd been sent a letter from Border Control in which it says that he must now, in public, wear the letter P but he's not told what the letter P stands for. And there is no appeal. That's it. He's been given the letter P, and he, he, he decides to go into hiding. And I wrote this piece, and it was so dystopian, it was so depressing, that quite frankly, if I went to see it, I would want to kill myself. So I just kind of thought, no, I'm not going to write that. I don't want an audience leaving with that sense of utter hopelessness and despair. What can I do? And I realised that what I needed was to, to see, to unearth as part of this piece, acts of resistance, acts of struggle, acts of resilience, and that part of that would be the creation of a corpus of songs that had been discovered by the main character, Jazz. So I've written this series of songs, and so in the middle of the play, um, this choir stands up. Part of the, it's a sort of reconstructed choir that sings these protest songs. And some of them are real, they're from my archive of songs from Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp, and then some of them are new ones, and one of them my daughter wrote, which is just terrific. And, um, and so the idea then is that out of the audience, there will be this choir that stands up and sings, so that you see this archive of resistance. So the play then follows the main, the map now, the main character of Jazz, and she goes back to the city of Churchill, which is the renamed city of London. 
and she goes back to, she's living in a post-fascist, post-apocalyptic world, but she goes back to London to help detoxify it and get rid of the landmines and get rid of the toxins and all of the things that have happened during this kind of process of fascism and, and limited nuclear exchange. Let's just hope it's just that um, in this near future. And we follow her remembering the journey of her father's disappearance and her discovery through this data centre that she uncovers of materials that suggest not only that was he living in the attic, but that also he was net casting as part of a resistance. And she also then begins to remember her own contribution that she didn't at the time understand of delivering secret messages to the local laundry. She begins to realise why it is that her mother was obsessed with sending laundry to the local laundrette when in fact she had a washing machine. She, you know, she was always arguing with her mother about this, but stitched into the seams were these tiny messages of resistance. So I'm just going to read you a bit, and it, it, you know, it will make kind of limited sense, but I'll read you a bit and then I'll comment on it, and then just as a way of suggesting that actually creative practice is a useful tool for thinking about this, these two things together of the social and anti-social life of memory. Scene one, a hilltop. Inside the former perimeter in the south of the destroyed city of Churchill, 2060s. There are trees surrounding a stone circle. Below are the ruins of houses and flats and a former female alignment centre for true training, a fact camp. There's the sound of a controlled explosion. Jazz. Before I was near blinded by the bomb, I'd walk over this same hill to what 20th sense called school. I'd pass the stone circle and these surviving oak trees, smaller then, greener. When I was strength grown to walk again, my broba, Zia, with his friend Samson, guided me. Samson telling me how the 19th century folk Save the Hillers Commons. That's why Samson said, forevermore. It is green forevermore. <laughs> but I mem, at 15, I ear gong growls of dozers. I feel hard frost churn to mud beneath my stick. The trees are shadowed by metal giants, cranes, and Zia in his older bro, but know it all way. Yo, sis, this is England first. I told you, this is what we voted for. Housing for all. There'll be flats, shops, always city views. England for the English, England first. But my bro must have seen, he must have well seen what I could not with my blinded eyes. By my girls' school, down there, ditches, razor wire, watchtowers. Within a week, I was forced striding the long way round. So that's just the opening of the play, of her beginning when she goes back to this hill, to remembering what happened at these early stages of fascism in Britain, the rise of fascism. I'm going to now read you something from a bit further on in the play. And it's just slightly further on. And Jazz has a brother called Zia, who he's really into playing video games and the sort of latest forms of virtual reality games. And the military have found that it's a really useful way of recruiting students through schools, through the cadet corps, by offering them 
the chance to play new and cutting edge games. And her brother goes down to a place that's currently called Aldershot and begins to play these games. And he basically then disappears. She never sees him again. Zia that day came back raging, blaming, saying I'd betrayed him, saying to mum and dad about the video games. And he went off that Friday for the trial for the lively. Don't fret back, girl. It's just a trial, a fun week. Samson high-fived. I'll see you. He's, I'll see he's OK. You see. But the boys were both selected. The next level. No outside contact except once a half moon. An Air Force security con to something like our Capcons. All good, Zia would say. Treating me well, I'm having loads of fun. I peered and ear gonged the comm so hard. There was sadding in the sound of Zia's voice. <coughs> A coughing. Three times. I remembered our childer's signal way back when. We had a code of coughs as children. <coughs> One, don't tell, <coughs> well scared, and then something else. I couldn't ken. Jura. He'd spelt out Jura. I didn't understand it then, but I do now. We'd both read Orwell's printing written there. It was like Big Brother, Ingsoc bad. Zia loved it here. After the terror bomb injured me and mum, killing 98 women and girls in Heroes Square, he'd bring me here in a chair on wheels and describe it. Sight making, we called it. Trees, birds. He knew all their names, but I couldn't see any more. The spring green of the North Downs beyond the perimeter. Below us, lights of the Twin Towers a presidential gift. Down there, some moon times back, Sonny and me, digging down, found what back then was a data centre, not shown on any map. ration fueled it must have been, while Churchill starved. We sparked up the data banks of snoopings and captured live casts, saved moons before England was shut up like a tomb. And we cracked the old codes and cranked it up, scraping the data for bit haunts of Zia, for Samson. There was nothing saved. But out of nowhere, I ear gone. I swear you, my dad buzz voice echoed through the tides and strides. So what she's describing there is, you know, they find this data center that she's looking for evidence of her brother and what happened to him and instead she finds this other story to do with her father and you'll notice as i'm talking that it's antisocial in its writing okay the vocabulary is not of now so you'll be thinking ear gone what's she on about you know ken what's that is that really english well no of course it's not it is and it isn't because this is written in the future and then in the far future. So there's three different vocabularies that I've had to construct here as part of the play. And, um, and of course, in, in going back, the character herself moves between them. Okay, so with the audience, you have to learn. It's, it's a kind of process of friction through which you have to learn, because there is no translation. I'm not going to provide a glossary. You have to kind of struggle to learn the language of the future. So just to read you the final um, part towards the end. Um, what happens at the end is that she remembers how she was desperate that her mum take in this girl from further up the street who's going to be sent off to a fact camp. And her mum refuses. And at the time, she thinks this, this is incredibly cruel. But what she didn't realise was that her mum was already setting something else up through the laundry. 
But what it also then leads to is a visit from the Red Jacks, which are the military police, who call at the house and completely demolish the inside of the house, vandalise it, and they rape her. And she finally gets to escape. So I'm just going to read it um, at the point where the rape stops, OK? I'm not going to just launch into that bit right now. Duff it! I remember then a voice shouts outside of me, Leave the bitch! Number 71, you're needed, now! The stinking weight on top of me moves. I hear the sound of a belt buckle, a zip. I can smell the voice nearer now. I feel a cold blade against my throat, the fog of breath, the sounds of men's laughter, boots on boards. I think, so this is it. He will cut my throat and I will die, choking in my own still warm blood. And I begin to struggle and I try to scream, but the front door bangs and the blade drops to something of before time London and he's slitting the plastic cuffs off my wrists. Don't tell anyone what I've done. Wait five till I'm gone. I'm sorry about their mothers. I'm sorry. And then the front door slammed again, and he'd gone. Samson. It was Samson. I tear the bag off my head, ease off the gag. I listen, feeling the sounds bleeding through the walls. The house is empty. I sense changes for a long time gone. The streetlights fray to dawn. I feel my way to the hall, find a stick, know my way round the house, smelling fresh paint, graffiti, shadow words, whore, slag, bitch, pervert. I stumble over printings with black poured over them, choke in the feathers of pillows and duvets slashed, feathers everywhere. I slip on the wet of men's piss down the stairs, semen on the beds, wretched shit in every room. I peer at the shadows of my face, feel huge lips swollen, feel bruises rising on my stomach, a body colonised, yet nothing hurts. I wash slowly, drink sweet tea, I think about phoning someone. But who is left? I pack a small bag, my English passport, a notebook, a pen. I lock up the house, post a spare key next door with a note. I shuffle to the laundrette where I've been many times for my mum. I can't wordle anymore, but the lady steers me through the back door. There's a jacket your mum left. It's a long time gone and many people here. I hid home to home, running long time away from Churchill, away from Europe, away from England, my heart sheared with pain, membered Mumba, Dadba, Zia, Mika, Samson. And I sight made this hill. I returned to this scrap of common land, unfenced, with its five oak trees, their leaves small, struggling, but the trees bigger now. Sonny and me, we led the recon team. We tried for solar rounds to clear the toxics until we were sick. Long, old, big stones. We stood up again and circled them. We ken the rocks will henge the dark power of the sun with the blood moon and echo all the time. It's deadly still, but one daybreak, your children's children will dance and feast on the green hill, singing our daughters out from the stones. And then the choir rises and sings, and they're joined by the full cast. So that's the end of the play. Now, one of the things that the play seeks to do is to show, to reveal this kind of toxic side of memory in our era through thinking about what it means to have a data centre unearthed in 50, 60 years' time. What will remain if London floods from the Thames? What will remain if there's a limited nuclear attack? Nothing will remain if there's a massive nuclear exchange, obviously, but you know, if there's a limited one, what will be left? And what will be left then if, if a refugee 
such as Jazz, who ends up in Antarctica, because that's one of the last safe places in this scenario. What is it then that she finds? And what is it that she then knows through revealing the antisocial life of memory? So that's just a taster of, of that bit of my work at the moment. And I, I know it's quite difficult, isn't it, just to kind of hear chunks of a play that you haven't read. Uh, so forgive me, but it's just, it's just a kind of a taster. Okay. And also, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, an actor, so I don't perform it particularly well. So just to summarise then, the antisocial life of memory is that which at times may cause annoyance and disapproval, we could say, if we're going to use this metaphor of the social life. It's unacceptable, it's offensive, it's disruptive, it's disorderly, it's lawless, it's rebellious. It's in some ways contrary to the mnemonic laws and customs of a particular social setting. And it may refuse mnemonic company quite deliberately. I've then talked about this, kind of in brief, this case study, looking at from rare earth to digital witness to show how we can think about the antisocial life of memory and social life of memory as two states happening at the same time that are implicated. Every time we look at the screen, you can now think about the antisocial life of memory that have enabled you to have your social life through Facebook, for example. And then I've suggested two examples of different kinds of methods, which they're not you know, particularly original, but this, this that kind of template that I showed you of states of memory capital is just a kind of model for enabling us to think about what happens through accumulated labour in terms of creating different states of memory capital, what frictions occur, what states of lawlessness are required or forgotten about in order to get to that state. And then the final idea, this sense of future memory, of, of taking a disruptive vantage point from the future. Um, and that's an imaginative act, and I think that that is really going to be very important to memory studies. You know, our work is memory, but actually thinking about how that connects with the imaginary, with creativity, is also keep en en enabling us then to keep a hold of hope, actually, in very difficult times. And that will be, it seems to me, the task of the mnemologist in the next five to ten years. Thank you very much. <laughs>